Hello, everybody. My name is Rick McCutcheon. I'm a Dynamics 365 Business Applications MVP, and I want to thank you for tuning in to Digital Adoption Talks. Today, there are over 300,000 business professionals with digital adoption in their job titles on LinkedIn. And on this show with my co-host, Joachim Schirmacher, CEO of ClickLearn, we're talking to some of the digital adoption leaders in our Microsoft ecosystem. This week, we are thrilled to be talking to Chris Garadini from Turnkey Technologies. Chris, you've got over 25 years of experience leading your partner organization. Chris, we'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your organization. Great. Thanks, Rick. Hi, Chris Garadini. Yes, I am the owner and president of Turnkey Technologies. I founded the company in 1994. So, from a background standpoint, I've been dealing with the dynamic solution since the mid 80s, so closer to 35 years in the ERP space. But today, so Turnkey's turning 29 next month, and again, we're, we're completely focused on the Microsoft Dynamics portfolio and the Microsoft Cloud Solution Stack. Really, we lead with the business applications. Again, about 85% of the practice is delivering ERP solutions. Dynamics GP, Dynamics Business Central, Dynamics Finance and Operations, and then the remainder of the practice is really the customer engagement platform, aka CRM, and then Power Apps, Power Platform, and certainly Modern Workplace and Azure. So we support the entire ecosystem of the business applications of the organization. The team operates, again, we're remote, we're in person. So we, we do both. We're U.S.-based, but we do have offshore. So we are a U.S.-based commercial. We also have a subsidiary corp in Mexico City. We service Latin America. We do transactions in the U.S. and Europe. So we're quite busy. So again, focused on medical device, manufacturing, defense contractors, professional services. So it's a lot of fun, Rick. Like I said, I've had a great ride and I'm still enjoying it. So thanks for having me today. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Yoko, would you like to say hello and add anything? I'd like to say hello to Chris. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I've been looking forward to this uh, conversation today. I think we're going to have fun. Okay, great. We'll start out by just talking about digital adoption in general, because the world's going through this transformation to cloud. Now we're going transformation to AI. <laughs> Lots of things are happening to organizations. So many organizations are pivoting. As, as Chris, you were saying, to more of a mobile workforce where we're not sitting together, we're not meeting quite as often. How do you think organizations are coping with this change that's really starting to occur now, but really started to rev up three or four years ago? There's, a, I would say, continuous evolution. So as what we saw happen in the early portions of COVID, and there was a lot of scrambling in 2000, but instantly in March of 2020, everybody didn't come back to work. And so even in our organization, we had a, a building full of people. And uh, you think about the reaction to that. Now, fast forward, it's been three years. Wow. A lot of evolution in thought processes around, are we all remote? Are we hybrid? And again, but as that evolution continues, people have They've pivoted on tools and they've pivoted on policies and they've pivoted on trying to build culture. So there's a lot of challenges. I could talk about a number of those points, <laughs> which one's the best one to dive off on. So the emergence of new tools and new markets. It's interesting how people do pivot where three years ago we couldn't think about this. And now all of a sudden it's part of life. Remote tools, remote video conferencing. Even before that, people didn't have cameras on. There's a lot more visibility and transparency into how people look and interact with each other. But again, the challenge with not having in-person is still compromising, I believe, in our business as well. And I think it compromises young workers. The senior workers really didn't have a problem with it, but the younger workers have been challenged. And I think that as things change, the culture, the work culture, the work disciplines, the ethics, there's a lot of things that are different. And, and, and technology can't fix all that stuff. And there was a mindset, I think, before COVID, that you couldn't deliver an enterprise CRM or ERP project without being on the ground with somebody. And I think that's gone away. I think that we thought it went away, but let's practice psychology for a minute. I went back to grad school to take psych because people didn't work right. And I've seen things fall apart because the people don't get any contact. And so in my opinion, you can do a large part of the life cycle of the deployment remote, no question about it, a lot of efficiencies, saving on T&E. However, I do believe that without building a rapport relationship with clients on the onset of a project, there's a compromised risk there. And I've seen it personally. So certainly we look at four touch points on an ERP implementation. We want the teams to be together at the very onset in the analysis phases and let them start building those relationships because I'm going to guarantee you, faces on the screen, they're not going to get to that point that they need where they trust 
trust is a big deal. And again, without trust in an implementation, so I think there's still a problem there. The people think they'd be 100% remote. Maybe they're lucky. Maybe they're smaller transactions, simpler. But in the larger, more involved, I really believe that there's multiple touch points where teams need to be together to really take the success to a new level. Opinion, and again, based on past performance, I think it's a real deal. Great. Yoko, would you like to add anything to what Chris said? <laughs> yeah, I agree. The biggest problem here is if you want to drive change, I can see that in my own business, but I can definitely see that among our clients, that if you have larger change projects where you're trying to impact, maybe uh, you have cultural impact on a large rollout of, of a solution, you might have uh, severe technical implications, you have severe user adoption issues. Uh, if you need to, uh, to cover all of that remotely, I don't think it's going to happen. I think that... If we look at, at the mergers and acquisition business, I can see in that business at least that there's still a lot of uh, uh, ground work to be done when it comes to building up the liaison, right? You got to build up the trust when you're doing significant changes, whether that's on M&A side or whether it's in an implementation project. But if there's not that level of trust, it's not going to happen. I, and I also see that I think that maybe I'm starting to get to the age where I'm confusing everything and mixing it up, right? It might be a little bit of COVID, a little bit of generation, and a little bit of this and that, and everything is mixed up. But when I look at it from the outside, there's definitely a change. I think that the young people or the new workers that are coming into an organization, they're definitely getting the B treatment, not the A treatment. And we can see that from a user adoption perspective, right? We're very focused on user adoption when we initially roll out the project. That's where we really want to be aligned. But are we covering the new employees that are coming into our organization at a later point? And what will the impact be when there's no longer a colleague sitting right next to you that can actually train you on doing your daily work? But that colleague is now a remote worker. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a game changer. And I'm not sure that we've seen the end of where this is taking us, but I can see that there are many things that have not become easier by having remote work at least and maybe this is why we're seeing these conferences these live conferences coming back very strong right now and chris and i were at one last week in florida that was probably 25 percent bigger than it was the year before i think maybe we need to see each other again and to keep building this relationship if we're doing business together yeah i think we all think it's important right in all aspects of our lives, we need to build that rapport because trust is what is it's the foundation of every business, right? So today we're talking about digital adoption, which is part of all this. But what technologies do we see coming down um, you know, the pike right now that are really going to affect digital adoption in the next couple of years? And we'll start with you, Chris. Sure. As we look at the way the tools have changed and the pivot, and again, three years ago, right? Oh, online collaboration tools. Wow, you talk about good stocks that you should have owned. But again, the adoption of that and the evolution of those tools has come a long way. Even video effects. Hey, there's all new palettes for backgrounds and stuff to make people. And there's even, are they doing those makeover things? But again, just the collaboration tools are part of it. But if you think about other tools besides that, even project management tools for collaboration. And then, okay, so... What else is we look at the reliance on CRM platforms for communication and just capture and really, because everybody's apart, it's not like I can go look and share and collaborate hard copy documents. So we've gone to a completely digital model where everything's accessible from everywhere. That's not going to change. But as we think about now AI coming into the play, it's like, okay, how's that changing? Because again, now people are so used to not dealing with contact, having real people, we're substituting artificial processes for people so there's a whole nother revolution that's going to go there so there's certainly industries i think are going to do better by this other ones it's still going to be challenging but the collaboration platforms are just part of it i think they've matured very well from a performance standpoint they weren't ready on the front end but now the rest of the tool in the business applications in the mobile apps where they've now really how do we create these apps to support the people that are not in the building OCR, AP automation, think about it. Nobody wants to touch paper, take paper out of the equation. There's another example. But even as you look at, when we didn't hear that word next to each other, mimic. People learn by mimicking each other. So you go back to what are the substitute technology tools that can simulate mimicking and learning? There we go. That's the There's the click learn plug, but that is it. As you look at how do we change the way that we learned in the past as well? So there's evolution. I see it in the tools. I see it in what 
what your company is doing, but there's a couple more examples there. Um, it's going to continue to evolve. Okay. And Joachim, would you like to add anything about what technology is coming that's going to yeah, change I'm, the way uh, we learn yeah. and adopt? Definitely. The, the evolution of AI, I think, is probably the biggest game change. I think in three years, we're going to see two teams. There's an A team and a B team, the ones that understand how to utilize that technology and the ones that are left behind. So I, I make a, a really strong impact in the, trying to, at least in my business, to make sure that everyone gets on the right train and start working with this technology. I'm concerned on a number of, you know, of areas around the, the AI platform and what I think is going to dilute the quality of the content. I think from a marketing perspective, we're going to see much more content automatically generated by AI out there. And I think that at some point we are hitting a dilution where the entire foundation of the AI is not AI, which is going to be so weird to look at. And I think it's uh, that will be definitely be the, uh, the wrong side of the evolution. But I can see my industry at least that the way that we've been thinking AI for so long, it's about how do we do machine learning? How do we do data breakdown, stuff like that? It's completely going to change now. We're going to see AI in a completely different perspective after ChatGPT. And I think it's going to be incorporating more technology. I like some of the things that Microsoft are doing, which is like fantastic, right? You can now have teams automatically do a summary of your Teams meetings, right? It's a plugin and you get a written, a written summary. Do you want one page, two pages, or do you just want 400 words on what was being talked about for two hours? And that's, I have no idea what that's going to bring us, but it's amazing. It's, a, it's an amazing journey that we're on right now. We are actually living it. This is something our kids are going to talk about someday. We were there when it happened. <laughs> And it's going to get interesting about what gets recorded. Right? So I think people are going to be much. more careful. I think people are going to say, hey, you need to ask permission if you want to record. I think a lot of these technologies are coming very quick, but I think they're going to sprout a whole new set of rules and a whole new way that we engage with people. Chris, would you like to add anything? And the next question yeah. I have for you is really... How's, what's the role of the Microsoft partner in this future? Sure. Yeah, just a couple comments. I think that people will lose skill sets in that evolution. People forget how to do things. And I think that's one of the one of the risks. And I think the other thing that the opportunity that's out there, Rick, in terms of technical products that should come into market, and someone may jump on this, is filters. We've got a new app called Filters. Let's filter all the information because I think your point is right, Yoshim, is that it's going to be an overabundance of noise and so people will be diluted in terms of are they focusing on the correct content? And I think that the concept of filtering in life, it's going to be a bigger deal. Maybe that's an app opportunity out there to create filters for yourself. But the role of the Microsoft partner is just that. It's envisioning. It's visionary. It's let me show you how the world can be different through the use of these tools. And a lot of times people, they can't see that. They've not had referenceable examples and in the example of the partner, I see all types of things. I've watched people do things for 35 years. I can tell you who does it well, who does it bad. Anyway, but those are the messages and the visions that we have to carry out to the customer market. We have to create that vision of how the world can be different with a power app, for example, or how an actionable Power BI report can work, or how a chatbot can really improve customer service. And today, are you using chatbots? And be like, I don't know, what's that do? Well, imagine it saying hello to your customer right away. Oh, wow, that could be great that he's getting real-time service. But again, back to the blur factor. But partners, exactly. We have to show them the way. It's the lead by example. I always argue to people, that say, what do I need? What do you need? Okay, you need to come in and tell me what I need, and that's the partner. The partner can't show up and not have some kind of an idea. But it is those experiences in delivering these solutions for other customers, improving they and, and demonstrating the ROI and saying these are successful solutions. People can put them in and have the similar outcomes as other organizations. That's our role, in my opinion. And I think to add on to that, the partner's going to have to change the way they communicate to the customer. I don't think they can wait around for the customer to ask for something. I think we need to be ongoing in our education of customers because it's coming at us so fast. And we understand a lot of it. And I just don't think the customers do or they don't understand how to absorb it in their organization. And on that point, if you think about to the marketing guy, the drip marketing, how do I educate people incrementally? So even my huge book of GP customers, how do I start showing them the way forward? I use the example that Microsoft would like to 
clear the room. I said, no, just open the doors and entice them out. But I think part of that is how do you show them that journey? And that's my job as a partner to convince these legacy customers that there's a vision that's not insurmountable. That's my job. And I have to show that roadmap and tell that story. And uh, anyway, whichever tool I use, and again, part of this is incremental knowledge and visualization. So we're trying to leverage all those things out there. So, Joachim, how would you like to see the partners that you work with in the future sort of <clears throat> engage in digital adoption? I think that they're doing the right thing. So I think we are seeing an increasing amount of partners that are building up the practices inside their business. And that means actually committing resources to uh, and finding out that it's good business to have user adoption because effectively that is what pays the bills because it's about successful products. And part of that journey in success be having successful customers that is actually educating and making sure that they are continuously educated inside the platform. So I think that that journey is is already going. I think out of the partners that we have today, I think half of them are committed to building up that practice and uh, on a very good movement in that. So I don't think, I think that we have the same role from my perspective that I think Microsoft partners have and that you touched, touched on, Chris, which is we need to show the vision and the way forward. It's not about, it's not about taking out the order book and saying, how many pieces of this do you need and how many pieces of this do you need? It's really about coming up with a coherent vision on how can your business be transformed. And the same thing we need to do for our partners. We need to show them that there is a coherent plan around driving the user adoption forward. And I think we are accomplishing that slowly with the partners and the partners are committing to building up businesses around us. So okay. happy, we are happy to hear us there. All right, great. Chris, I want to thank you for joining us today on this podcast. And I'd ask you just for a couple of closing remarks. Yeah, it, it, the emphasis on adoption is, as you said, it's the key to success, is to support the users in learning and actually using the tools and measuring that and continuing to invest in this. And it doesn't stop. Again, it's instrumental to the business. That success of your user community and using the tools that you've selected will drive your business success. Okay, thank you. Yoko, anything from your end? It's been a real pleasure having you, Chris. Sometimes these discussions, they take us way beyond the topic of user adoption. It's one of those days where we are just uh, we're starting out uh, with, with user adoption ending up in AI and uh, talking about the psychology of, of uh, working in a mobile uh, workforce or working from home. So this has been really interesting. It's good stuff. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, gentlemen. And we'll see you soon and talk to you more in the future, Chris, about the cloud AI and digital adoption. Sounds great. Thank Have you. Have a great day.